You're right. welcome. <laughs> Okay, so um, hello everyone and thank you for being here. My name is Paul D'Ambrosio and I teach Chinese philosophy at East China Normal University in Shanghai, where the Sakai Weishue Collaborative Learning Project is based. I want to welcome you to our final event for the Sakai Weishue Collaborative Learning Project before we take a break for the summer and begin again in September. Today, we are going to have a lecture by Li Jenko. The title of her talk is Authentic, Accurate, Real, Validity and the Cult of Qing or Emotion in the Late Ming Poetic Criticism. We have a very nice group of young scholars here to discuss with Professor Jenko. They include Rachel McVeigh from Harvard University, Jokin Oh from the University of Minnesota, and our chair Li Luyao from Nanyang Technical University in Singapore. The lecture time will be at 90 minutes in total, and will end promptly at 8.30 p.m. Beijing time. For the first 40 minutes or so, Professor Jenko, and Professor Jenko, just however long you want, right? So um, don't worry about this. Um, but for about 40 minutes or so, she'll give her talk. And then we have a discussion between her and the commentators and chair. And then if there's time, we'll open the floor for questions from the audience. Before getting started and handing things over to Li Luyao, I want to say a few things about the Sakai Weishue Collaborative Learning Academic Forum. The Sakai Weishue Collaborative Learning Project hopes to distinguish itself from some of the less productive conventional practices in contemporary academia. As posted on our website, we are not interested in male peacocks, in jerks, or in any form of egoism or self-promotion. We hope to curb all types of aggressive and look at me, I'm smarter than you, or don't I know so much, and similar types of attitudes we sometimes find in academic exchanges. The Sihai Weiser Collaborative Learning Project seeks to accomplish these shifts in orientation during academic exchanges by encouraging productive communication, humble discussions, real questions, and responses that are open and honest. We hope to foster environments where people truly learn from and with one another. Before introducing our chair, I want to once again thank Professor Lehi, uh, Lee Jenko, Rachel McVeigh, Zhou Yun Oh for, uh, for joining us. Our chair today is Li Luyao. She is a PhD candidate from Nanyang Technical University. Her research interests include philosophy of the Zhuangzi, political and comparative philosophy, and she is currently working on coexistence of harmony and freedom in the Zhuangzi. She's also the director of the Chinese social media for Sakai Weishue, which is no small task, as she just mentioned. Um, and she does a lot of work in this area, so we're really lucky to have her. Thank you very much, Lu Yao. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Paul. And please allow me to introduce our speaker today, uh, Professor Lee Jinko. Uh, she is a professor of political theory in the Department of Government at the London School of Economics and Political Science. She has taught at universities in Singapore, Taiwan, Germany, and the U.S. Her research specialism is Chinese political thought uh, from the late imperial to the modern era. So she said that she never dreamed she would have anything to say about the Ming Dynasty poetic criticism. Her publications include Changing Reference, Learning Across Space and Time in China and the West, and Making the Political, Funding and Action in Political Theory of Zhang Shizhao. She is also co-author of the definitive Oxford Handbook of Comparative Political Theory. Most recently, she has co-authored a text textbook uh, titled Political Theory, a Global and Comparative Introduction, which is forthcoming next year. So uh, let's welcome Professor Jinko to present her talk. Um, thank you, everyone. And let me start by apologizing to everyone that my video does not seem to be working, um, which is very annoying to me and to everyone involved. Um, for q and I may try to 
uh, use my iPhone camera, but I do have to hold it in order for everyone to see the video. So uh, while I'm giving the talk, uh, you'll just be looking at the slides anyway. Um, but uh, before I get to the talk, let me thank um, everyone involved in this uh, collaborative learning project, um, uh, including um, uh, everyone at ECNU and my commentators and the chair. I see some friends um, and some new friends and old friends that are on the call. So that's really gratifying to see. Um, as Lu Yao explained, um, I am primarily, or at least I, up until a few years ago, I thought of myself as a political theorist who studied mainly political things. Uh, and so it surprised me as much as anyone else that I suddenly found myself um, in the thick of Ming Dynasty debates on poetic criticism. But one of the reasons um, I turned to this field of study was because it increasingly dawned on me that at least in the Ming Dynasty, the late Ming Dynasty, there were a lot of interesting political questions that centered on literary and poetic expression. And if I were to simply study politics as we might consider it now, say in the modern uh, liberal Western countries, it would not necessarily match up very well to how late Ming thinkers saw or looked at um, meaningful action in the world. So this explains a little bit my trajectory. Um, nevertheless, this project is, this paper I'm about to present, um, it is a, probably a one-off for the moment, but at the end of my talk, um, I gesture towards some of the broader questions. I think that the talk opens up, um, and these are questions that I remain interested in. I don't know, given all the projects I'm currently working on, um, I don't know how quickly I can pick up these threads, uh, but I hope um, at some point to, um, to consider them. So I very much welcome questions on any aspect of the talk, whether on the main body of the talk or on the the sort of the broader gestures I make uh, towards the end. So um, with that in mind, let me share my screen with you and my PowerPoint. And you should all be able to see that. So let me start the slideshow. Um, so today I'm gonna be talking to you about what turns out to be a very well-studied topic in late Ming history and literature, which is this idea of Qing emotion or passions and how this plays a role in thinking about um, what is actually, as I say in the slide, authentic, accurate, and real. Um, the broader setting for the paper are these debates about what to do with the so-called 17th century Chinese Enlightenment or the 16th and 17th century Chinese Enlightenment. Um, I'm inspired by scholars, uh, most recently by Rivi Handler-Spitz, um, but also earlier scholars such as Joseph Fletcher, who note that China is actually part of a global early modern. Um, it was contextualized uh, within um, a range of seismic transformations that were happening not just in China, but that had parallels in Europe, including territorial expansion, commercialization, um, mobility socially and geographically, uh, the expansion of print, um, intensified use of land, advances in maritime transport and technology, et cetera. Um, many of these um, parallels between China, Europe, and other parts of the world that formed a global early modernity were noticed um, as early as the 1960s by someone like Ted DeBerry. And he argued we should look to this period of enlightenment um, in China for um, thinking about uh, the roots of what was ultimately something like liberalism in China. And he argues that Wang Yangming's idea of sagehood, which was prevalent in the late Ming period, opened the way to a kind of popular movement involving a greater potential participation of ordinary men, and actually I would add women too, in the fulfillment of Confucian ideals. And in DeBerry's view, um, this was a major moment because it afforded an enlarged view of human experience. So not just the emphasis on, on ritual action and obligation, but also um, an opening to start thinking about authentic Qing emotion, sentiments, um, even things like erotic passion suddenly became um, topics of conversation 
and in many ways were subject to a kind of transvaluation um, among many writers and thinkers in the late Ming period. Um, so a lot of the existing scholarship on this period, of which there is a lot, I've discovered, um, tend to emphasize sort of one or two trends, one of two trends. Much of the existing scholarship, especially coming out of um, DeBerry and Columbia University in the 60s and 70s, were very much um, focused on thinking about how the philosophy of Neo-Confucianism and the transformations it was undergoing in the 16th and 17th century gave rise to a new valuation of individuality, of subjective experience or liberalism. Um, alternatively, and I think more recently, um, most scholars focus uh, instead on the opportunities and the expansion for vernacular literature and personal expression that these kinds of early modern transformations facilitated. Um, so, oops. So, see, I was trying to be clever and I added an animation to add my response and then it skipped to the next slide. Sorry about that. But my response um, is instead to think about a slightly different question. Whereas um, many of the, much of the conversation about the 16th and 17th century um, and the focus on uh, emotion or sentiment in China at this time has tended to focus on literature or on philosophy. Um, I think there was also a space as it became, well, at least um, as I started, I started to notice as I was reading more and more of the work dating from this period, that there was more of an emphasis on, um, not just on Qing as a kind of subjective experience that required a form of expression in literature or poetics, but there were also claims about Qing that tied them to claims about reality. Um, so I suppose you could say this is a question about the metaphysics of Qing, not just its expansion or its expression in literature or in a kind of individualistic philosophy. So I wanted to ask how these kinds of claims about Qing reveal or affect how reality is understood by these thinkers. And it turns out that many of these thinkers were actually quite concerned with questions of what I call, this is my word, validation. Um, that is to say, they were more than minimally interested in thinking about how Qing, our emotions or our sentiments, legitimated claims about reality. That is to say, how they confirmed or affirmed that our claims about reality were real claims, that they were actually stating the thing that they claimed to state. Um, and this is actually related, oddly enough, to transformations in Neo-Confucianism, mainly associated with Wang Yangming, um, but that are often seen as um, speculative and abstract. Um, Nevertheless, um, I say that this turn, or I, I hold in this in this paper, that a, a turn to this Qing, a new valuing of Qing um, in the mid to late Ming, actually not only encouraged the kind of speculative introspection that we find in someone like Wang Yangming, um, but it also meant that lived experience and the authenticity of that experience started to become valued as well. So it wasn't simply introspective. It also had some kind of connection to lived uh, reality um, and to embodiment. Um, and that these kinds of experiences became valued um, for their contribution to moral accomplishment. That is to say, um, Wang Yangming's doctrine of um, the unity of knowledge and action, for example, uh, helped thinkers connect what they were experiencing with what they could morally know. And likewise, what they morally know also had to be validated. It had to be embodied in a particular kind of experience, but it also became valued for a certain kind of signposting of moral accomplishments so that the way you lived your life became a paradigmatic example of one's own uh, moral status. And I wanna argue out of these uh, commitments, there came to open space for a, a new role or a new way of thinking about Zhen, which is a term that can be translated in any of a number of ways. Um, here, 
I think about Jun, which can be real or genuine, I also think it's implicated in questions of accuracy. Um, there was, in effect, a new appreciation for changing particulars. I'm taking that uh, turn of phrase from An Chonying, such that thinkers became aware of the way in which Qing could validate how the changing particulars of their existence or of their particular kinds of experience could be linked up to um, moral claims. Um, and that, that this actually did turn on some kind of accurate reckoning with the empirical world. Um, the empirical world defined very broadly, not just the natural world, but it could also mean um, personal experience, subjective experience, uh, the reading of past texts, um, historiographical research, et cetera, but that there was nevertheless this kind of emphasis on, on a kind of accurate reckoning. Um, and this reckoning was also associated by these thinkers people such as Li Zhi, Jiang Yingke, and others with Zhen, with this concept of Zhen, real or genuine. Um, so Zhen and Qing and these conversations does not only point to the authentic expression of some kind of subjective experience in literature, um, it also had something to do with what counted as real and authentic. And as it turns out, literature and poetry specifically became a battleground over what that meant. Um, and this is also the story of how I came to be interested in it. Um, so if we accept with many of these lightning thinkers um, that poetry is the genre that most reflects that kind of accurate reality or that at least um, embodies the, I suppose the most um, trenchant or poignant form of lived experience, um, then it, it also invites lots of different kinds of inquiry. Um, and I don't discuss all of that inquiry, those forms of inquiry here. Um, much of this I cover in other published works or maybe other parts of an emerging book project, although I haven't decided yet whether I'm gonna write about this specifically. But um, one of the things it may invite is, is a kind of ethnographic reflection or documentation of poetry among other groups, non-Han Chinese groups, um, or non-elite groups. So in the case of Yangshan, you do get some reflection on the capacity for poetic expression among non-Han Chinese in the borderlands, um, because he was he was someone who was exiled to Yunnan, and while he was in Yunnan, he, he does some of this work, or he begins some of this work. Um, and then I'll also be talking briefly in this talk about Jiang Yinke, who's a relatively unknown or less talked about figure, but turned out to be um, uh, very um, sort of more well-known and, and more revered among his peers. And he talks about um, how the, the commoner classes, those who were not elites, um, could also retain a capacity for this kind of poetic expression. Um, Poetry may also invite new forms of reading uh, to take account of the different realities that classic texts may contain. Um, and here I've published something on Chen Di's work on the Shi Jing, where he begins to read the Shi Jing um, as a kind of ethnographic documentation of many different kinds of regionally inflected languages and experiences. Um, and then finally, um, it may also be the case that um, folk songs could also be uh, real poems that also voice the real experiences um, of diverse groups in a, in a more ethnographic or kind of empirical way. Um, and this is also work that I am publishing or in the in the process of publishing on Feng Menglong's 16, circa 1610 collection of folk songs from Suzhou called Xianggu, the mountain songs. Um, so these are kind of the stakes, the broader stakes of the project. And I don't necessarily go into all of that detail here in the talk. Um, what I'm going to talk about now and what I focus the paper on is actually a series of um, observations and conversations that were happening among a group of interconnected scholars loosely associated with what's known as the Gong'an School of Poetry. And the Gong'an School of Poetry aligned itself against Bu Gu Pai, the what was in English, it's often translated as the Restorationist Movement. The Restorationist Movement claimed 
basically, uh, that uh, authentic poetic expression necessarily had to reflect the language and preoccupations of the ancients, right? So that it, you restored ancient language, you restored the Guwen of the ancients, and that is what constitutes authentic poetic expression. And by the ancients, of course, they also meant the Han and the Tang poets, especially the Tang poets. Um, and against this view, the Gong'an school, led by people such as uh, Yuan Hongdao and Yuan Zongdao, as well as sort of in and out Li Zhi, claimed that true poetry should reflect authentic experience of the poet. And it's here uh, in this claim and identifying their claims and sort of hashing out what that, what that actually meant um, and what it meant to reflect real experience and what it meant for a poem to be real if it was rooted in its time and place uh, and subjective experience. A lot of really interesting things come to be said about what is real and authentic in general. And as it turns out, uh, these concerns, both about poetic expression and about understandings of what is, I suppose, what we would call empirically real or uh, verifiably real in an objective sense, uh, play a major role in how thinkers like Li Zhi and later, as I will explain, Zhang Yingke, actually come to understand what Qing uh, emotions and what authentic emotions mean. Um, so in the paper, I analyze a number of, I translate and analyze a number of passages, um, particularly from Li Zhi, because he's at the center of this movement. He also wrote a lot. He was very glib, as most people know. Um, but he was also kind of interesting because he's often understood and secondary scholarship as something of a relativist. So clearly he would be one of the first people one might go to if you're thinking about um, how and why Ming thinkers talked about what was real and what was not real. Because as a relativist, it would imply that he would have um, at the very least a vexed relationship to what was real um, and maybe even a relativistic or a kind of skeptical approach to what was real. As it turns out, he doesn't, or at least not in my reading. Um, I examine some of the writing that he produced uh, when he was in his Buddhist chapel monastery area in Machang. Um, and one of the essays um, written about him or written by him about his experience there has to do with a lay follower coming to present him with a gemstone that is meant to be put in the top knot of uh, a Buddha statue that Li Zhi is in the process of building at Ma Chang at this, at this Buddhist chapel. Right? Um, and it's a very long, I mean, it's a very long essay. So I just reproduced part of it on the slide and I have the Wen Yan there so you can check my translation. Um, but basically what happens is uh, Li Zhi takes this gemstone and he tells his followers to bring him a clump of grass. And he tries to see if the gemstone will attract the grass, like if the grass will like stick to the gemstone and it doesn't. And he said, I think it's because the grass must be rotten. So please bring me another clump of grass. And they bring him another clump of grass and the gemstone does attract the grass, right? And at that point, the monk that is Li himself becomes, is, is quite gratified, right? He's saying, the stone is real after all. And at this point, Leecher starts to discourse upon what it means to be real. And what's notable about this passage, the passage translated on the slide, is precisely that Lee connects not just the realness or authenticity of a gemstone, something that's empirically verifiable using methods like the suctioning of the grass to the gemstone uh, that indicate a kind of empirical objectivity to its realness, um, but also a realness that involves one's uh, moral knowledge, as well as claims about what true reality is. Right? So he says, and I'm reading from the slide now, uh, this realness does not come from my pleasure with it being real. So here he's talking about the realness of the gemstone. He says, it is rather the case that the Buddha is wholly real. And so the world has real people. And afterward, it is known that there is a real Buddha. There is a real Buddha. So he naturally loves these real people. 
Only what is real can know the real. Only what is real can approach the real. Only what is real can ponder the real. How appropriate. However, he says, it is not only the Buddha who loves this real stone. I too love the real stone. And not only is it I who loves the real stone, it is also the case that this piece of real stone constantly wants others to know it is real. And so it does not want people to use rotten grass to misrepresent it as not real. Bringing this real stone near rotten people who pull up rotten grass, I guess he's, he's throwing shade on some of his followers at this point, is to not know its nature. So that even though this stone is real, it ultimately would die in the hands of people like that. So there's much to be said about this passage, but I find it quite revealing. And it's not a passage that gets discussed very much um, among scholars who study Leecher. Um, but part of what he's trying to say I, in this passage and in the, uh, the sort of the broader um, excerpts from scholarship that I examine in the paper is that um, Xing uh, helps us to understand ourselves, but we ourselves, are real people, or if we are real people and we have real Qing, um, that can give us the best guide to moral truth. And he writes a bit here too, quite a bit actually, on poetry and thinking about the ways in which actually poetry must be guided by Qing, by the emotions, which should be real and authentic. But this realness also determines what a real poem is. Xing points to something real, something authentic, which as it turns out for Leecher, he connects to the very patterns in society as well as in aesthetics and the empirical world that he identifies as real. So for Leecher, what is real will be manifest, the same thing will be manifest in patterns in society. To him that meant ritual, orthodoxy and textual learning as well as in aesthetics. For him, and in poetry especially, this was poetic meter, resonance, form, and stylistic differences. And also in what we would call philosophy. Um, this is where his allusion to the real Buddha, to the genuineness of a gemstone, to the real people who could both know the Buddha and know the genuine gemstone um, are linked. And then the empirical world, right? So all of these things to lead you are not only real, they're also continuous with each other. Um, this is a form of monism. So far from how Leecher is usually read as a, as a kind of iconoclast, an errat erratic iconoclast, or even as a relativist, he's actually, I don't read him that way at all. I see him very much as a monist. He sees all real art, like all real experience, like all real moral law, like social patterning, including ritual, to be validated by and in reference to a single underlying reality, which is the self-so, right? That which is natural, or in his case, because he was, of course, um, a Buddhist as well as a good Confucian, um, he saw it as related to that single underlying reality that in Buddhism um, is the truth towards which all followers are, are sort of oriented, right, tata -ta. Um, So this introduces a tension in Leeds' work. Despite the fact that he's known as an iconoclast and he's someone who is rejecting, as I said, the, the fugu pai, the restorationist school of poetry. And he says that poems and all writing and literature has to reflect the time and place. It has to reflect this personal experience. We know the genuine personal experience, real personal experience in Leeds' mind as articulated by real people will in fact coincide with both a certain kind of aesthetic form with the truth of the empirical world, as well as the underlying reality of all things found in Buddhism, right? So how far outside of accepted styles, meter, ritual forms, or much else really can lead you go? Um, I don't think, according to this philosophy, I don't think that he can go very far. Um, but someone who did take these, these assumptions or these um, claims about Qing in poetic expression further is Jiang Yingke. Um, so Jiang Yingke was another contributor to the Gongan school of writing and poetry, 
Um, and he was a very close friend of Yuan Hongdao, who is typically associated with that school. He's a lot less well studied than Yuan Hongdao. Um, but he has a very interesting and quite extensive uh, poetic theory that he introduces in his text. Um, I think it's the uh, collection of the uh, from the Snowbank Cabinet, which is the name of his poetry collection. So in this, in this, these series of essays he writes about poetic criticism or poetic theory, he introduces um, an alternative possibility that links the Qing, the real Qing of poetic expression, uh, to what is real and authentic. So Jiang Yingke puts forward the idea that. The aesthetic resonance of poems that the Gongan school was aiming for, this um, kind of continuity with the time and place of their composition, their continuity with personal experience, this, and, and then the continuity with how a reader or a listener would um, react to these poems, would only work if those poems reflect something real. And Zhang Yingke understood this reflection of something real as the author's own experience, his or her own experience of the particularities of, of his or her time and place. Okay? Um, in Chinese poetic theory, that's called shu, like things and affairs, right? Um, we might call it something like contextual particularity or something like this. Um, and if that's the case, if the, poet, if the poet succeeds in crafting something that is real and authentic in this way, the reader's ching or emotion in responding to the poem will validate the ching of the author in writing it. That is to say, it will not only legitimate the feeling that the author had in writing it, but it will also be the same kind of feeling. And that will be a mark of a true, real, authentic poem, a jinshi. But one consequence of this for Jiang Yingke, as he explains in his essays, is that literature and poetry, he's speaking mainly of poetry, must not only be timely in the sense that it has to reject ancient forms and has to speak in its own colloquial dialects, it must speak to the, uh, to the objects and affairs and the matters of its own time and place, it must also offer an accurate portrayal of the world as it is now in its specificity. That is to say, it has to be accurate in that it can't simply disclose something that is delinked from the author's own experience or delinked from what actually really, quote unquote, really exists in the world. Jiang Yingke says this takes guts. This is the guts for doing poetry, which is how I translate um, should then. Right, which is the name of one of his uh, essays of poetic criticism. And it takes guts because it means you would potentially have to depart from the forms and language of the ancients in crafting poetry, and you would have to potentially invent language sufficient for disclosing the reality of your own experience. Right? And if you succeed in doing this, um, you will have given your poem flavor or chu. That's the character at the end of the slide. Um, now this flavor or chu is what is disclosed in a real poem. It's the information about the poet and his or her circumstances and experience that are reflected in the poem. Um, so it's not necessarily in a, in a bit of a contrast with Leecher, for Jiang Yingke, what is disclosed in the poem is then not that some particular manifestation of realness or authenticity continuous with the realness of the natural or social worlds, which is what Li Zhi is basically saying, um, but it's rather information about something much more specific in particular about the poet's particular contextual circumstances and experience. And if that is achieved, the poem will have flavor and it will therefore be a real poem. Here in this quote, which I've translated, this is from his essay, Valuing Realness, Gui Zhen. Um, Jiang Yingke says, in terms of writing poetry, if the poem is connected to reality, even if it, the poem is not fully lovely, it will certainly have flavor, chu. Um, 
if it emerges from falseness, it may not necessarily be unlovely, but even if it is lovely, it itself will lack flavor. Shoot. So what he's saying here is that he's not necessarily as concerned about a, a real poem is not necessarily as concerned with being lovely or beautiful or well-crafted, but rather simply having this shoot, this flavor this, that, that connects it to reality and validates it as an accurate representation of reality. Um, his example is here. Consider a scholar official of our class with official robe and broad sash. Even if his face be unattractive and his appearance unprepos unprepossessing, people will always respect him. They will respect his realness, his gen. Now imagine an actor, handsome and imposing. Give him an official robe and broad sash to wear, and he will indeed look quite impressive and noble. And yet, people will look down at him. They will look down at his falseness. So in other words, John Lincoln Coe seems convinced that people would be able to tell the difference between a scholar official and an actor who's cosplaying a scholar official because the one is real and the other isn't. He gives another example of painting a portrait. And he said, if someone, if the brother or son of the person whose portrait was painted can say, aha, that is my father, that is my brother, then that portrait achieves true, it achieves realness. If it does not, no matter how lovely or beautiful the picture is, it lacks reality, it lacks flavor, and it therefore has no connection to what someone who also shares the same experience would recognize as an accurate portrayal of that experience or as an accurate portrayal of that person or thing. Now, it might seem as though this is a fairly arcane debate within Chinese poetic criticism, but I think there are actually some interesting further possibilities that are open by this reading. And as I mentioned at the start of this talk, at some point I hope to pursue these. It's a it's quite a big task, as you can see. Um, but I, th I think that, you know, maybe um, perhaps in a few decades, I will possess the wisdom, wisdom to, to pursue these, these possibilities. So, um, I actually think um, that taking seriously these claims in Chinese poetic criticism about the link between poetry experience and the disclosure of what we might consider to be an empirical reality um, suggests uh, that poetry um, introduces new possibilities for inclusion. Um, particularly if you can accept that a real poem will reflect real experience um, and this real experience does not have to, it doesn't have to be lovely. It doesn't have to necessarily abide by particular kinds of forms or categories of poetic expression. Um, and this potentially opens the way uh, to understanding and valuing the poetry of non-elites um, as being real poetry. Um, this is something I suppose I am continuing to research. I do have a project now on Fang Menglong's Mountain Songs which as some of you may know, um, is a well-known 17th century collection of uh, urban folk songs from Suzhou uh, that are arguably uh, of non-elites, right? Of, of the laboring classes, the non, the commoner classes. Um, so that's one possibility. Uh, the other possibility is that um, no division between fact and value ever really emerges in early modern China. Um, Poetry and aesthetic experience remain integral to the presentation of both empirical and moral reality. Um, so there's a few people in working in Chinese history of science um, who try to emulate a kind of caricatured version of the Western scientific revolution where that is understood to mean a fracturing or a breaking apart of fact and value. Um, and there's a bit of scholarship in Chinese literature and history, especially that tries to showcase the ways in which late imperial Chinese literati began uh, or cultivated interests in things uh, in knowledge for its own sake, right? Emulating this idea that there can be a division between the facts of reality and the values, the moral values that literati were seen to be gaining from them. But I'm not actually sure that any division, any such division ever emerges. Um, and I think we see that on view in these um, in these examples from Li Zhi and Zhang Yingke, in which morality and empirical reality are seen as continuous rather than as sh sharply defined and separate. Um, an interesting contrast as it happens might be to early modern England 
and I feel compelled to include this because I myself am technically British as well as American. Um, around the same time that this was all happening in China, there were these debates um, at the Royal Society in London um, about what speech suits best suits the, the emerging language of science. And it's around this time that poetry comes to be cast out as a scientific language, as a precise or analytically useful language. Hobbes and the Leviathan um, famously discusses the right definition of names and talks about the need to define and hammer and pin down uh, particular specific uses of speech, right? Which he allies with the acquisition of science. Um, and there's a larger movement understay, underway in early modern England as the scientific revolution begins to take shape um, and poetry is, is seen eventually as best suited to emotions. The, the language of best uh, suited to science, by the way, was actually not language at all, but mathematics. Um, in any case, there are some contrasts here to how we think about um, the emergence of fact and value, the emergence of scientific speech, and as a social scientist, the ways in which we as social scientists document a social reality. Um, but because of the way the scientific revolution took place um, and how we come to understand both early modern and modern science, um, I, I feel as though we have drowned out other kinds of possibilities, one of which might be the ways in which po poetry and poetic criticism in late imperial China itself documented a way of coming to terms with or reckoning with empirical reality that has some affinities, if not to natural science, then to social science. Um, and if we fail to see this, I feel we might be diminishing the contribution of Chinese writers to the history and philosophy of social science. That's all I have. Thank you all for listening um, and I welcome your questions. Uh, thank you, Professor Jinko, for your great presentation. Uh, please allow me to invite our first commentator, uh, Rachel uh, McVin. Uh, Rachel McVin is a doctoral student in pre-modern Chinese literature at Harvard University. She is interested in the interplay between individual creation and communal conventions in medieval poetry, which has also led her to publish on conceptions of authentic, authentic poetry in the late Ming. Having previously completed her master's degree at Peking University, she is committed to further scholarly dialogue between universities in China and West. Now let's welcome Rachel McVin. Uh, thank you so much. And um, thank you so much, Professor Jenko, for this absolutely wonderful paper, um, which I think really convincingly broadens our understanding of Xiong as it relates to authenticity in the late Ming. Um, and in particular, I'd like to say that it's really heartening to see the integration of intellectual history, uh, as I suppose I've probably characterized some of this, with, with literary thought, um, as they have so much to say to one another, especially in this period in which, as you say, the literary is not really distinct from the political or you know, God forbid, the quote unquote philosophical. Uh, and as you as you identify, it's in literary thinking that these broader ontological questions of an individual's relation to a wider extra subjective reality are conceived, perhaps, perhaps the most lucidly and with the greatest nuance. Um, so there's a centrality, as you say, of the aesthetic. Uh, and I think this speaks really greatly to the importance of interdisciplinarity in our work as scholars. Um, so uh, I, you know, I, there are just a few issues, a few things that uh, maybe the paper made me think of that I would love to just raise and perhaps chat about in further detail. Um, so firstly, you talk about uh, the the um, part of authenticity is producing an authentic reflection of a particular time and place, right? Um, and there are seen to be particular forms that are timely in some sense that reflect in a particularly uh, apt way a certain time and place. But then there's also, um, as other sources that you, you very suggest, um, an individual kind of authenticity, that each individual has their own kind of nature and their own uh, their own uh, way of being. So, um, and of course, that goes back very far. That it draws on quite early discourses in things like uh, quite, you know, perhaps essentialist ideas about regional character in like the Guofeng, um, and then to something like Cao Pi's exposition of the Qi of individuals in the third century. Um, uh, uh, as as said, I'm a medievalist. I have to bring in Cao Pi, but um, 
I'm interested in this possible tension between um, a heightened sense of individual character on the one hand and a more general concern with authentically reflecting the character of a time or place, even as you say, ethnographically uh, on the other. So literati in the late Ming, for example, often spoke about the differing characters of dynasties in the in the early medieval period. So, you know, the heroic way or the decadent southern dynasties and so on. So how do you represent authentically both the effective character of an individual phenomenological experience and a response um, and that of an overarching era. So, you know, for example, you know, what if you're a bold, heroic kind of person in a soft, decadent kind of era? Um, have you come across anything that kind of alludes to this tension or, or how do you see it being negotiated? Um, does the answer lie in the meeting of these two as a sort of joining of the internal and the external? Um, and secondly, and continuing on this idea of uh, this sort of conjunction of, of inner and outer, um, it seems that many of the ideas that you describe are in dialogue with earlier understandings of Xiong in terms of its relation to the outside world, right? Um, I mean, we think of gan wu, like being stirred by external things. So one's internal disposition is moved by the external world and emotion thus emerges as not a distinctly internal subjective experience, but as, as one that exists in fundamental and necessary continuity with what is objective and exterior, almost like this kind of monism that you you, dis, you discuss with Leech. So I think this kind of longer tradition of this idea is important for the identification of Xiong as relating to some externally verifiable validity, perhaps, that um and, and not just pure quote unquote subjectivity. But you know, I wonder if pre modern Chinese conceptions of emotional experience were always predicated on a kind of inseparability of quote unquote subjective and objective and not a sort of post-enlightenment demarcation of, of self and other. Um, and finally, so uh, you also touch on the kind of radical possibilities of, of Jainka's conception of poetry as, as representing reality. Um, I'd like to kind of explore further the implication of uh, uh, of Junxiong within the social context of the late Ming, which was of course um, uh, uh, characterized by relative social fluidity and, and corresponding literati anxiety about falseness in this increasingly um, commercial society. So the concept of Junxiong to me seems to have the potential um, to be both very inclusive and very exclusive. Um, so that if authentic poetry is based primarily in this authentic, valid response to a, a verifiable external reality, um, including everyday experience, then it may be potentially both writable and readable by anyone, and, and you know, as you say with the folk song. Um, but equally, it makes the judgment of literary composition and interpretation or the, the evaluation of it um, based on a potentially rather arbitrary standard of authenticity or validity with regards to what counts as, a, as an apt representation or an accurate represent, represent, uh, reckoning, like being able to, you know, in the story of the um, sort of being able to magically recognize an actor dressed as a scholar official somehow, um, so instead of literary conventions that actually, although potentially they require a certain amount of learning, also they are something that there are rules there that can be learned and imitated by pretty much anyone. Uh, whereas this seems to potentially take away those rules and therefore actually maybe um, more firmly locate the power to evaluate and to judge poetry uh, or maybe even behavior more broadly uh, among the elite and something that's perhaps more ineffable. Um, so who is it that determ who determines what is objectively real or apt or, or valid is it, um, in poetry? Um, do you think that, that would you agree with that characterization? Or, uh, you know, do you think that both of those aspects are at play, um, drawn upon by different actors at different moments, or, or, or do you think of it in a different way? Um, so yeah, once again, thank you so much for such a great paper. I learned a lot and um, I'd love to hear, your, hear more of your thoughts. Thanks, Rachel. I was nodding my head the whole time and taking careful notes. You just couldn't see it because um, my camera isn't working. But thank you very much. Is, there is another discussant, is that right? Is it is it Ju uh, Jujun? Uh, yeah, but Professor Jinko, you could uh, like uh, respond first and then uh, uh, Jun uh, and then uh, uh, Jun uh, would uh, comment uh, after your response. Um, okay, um, sure. Um, I'm trying to get my camera working. It's not working. <gasps> never mind, never mind. I'm just going to turn my video off. Um, so th thank you, Rachel. Um, as it turns out, a lot of your questions also relate to the project I'm doing on um, Feng Menglong. So this is actually really uh, helpful. And I don't know that I have good responses, 
uh, to all of your questions, uh, but I am definitely thinking in the process of thinking about them. So um, one of the things I wanted to address is this, um, this kind of interesting tension or maybe continuity between the interior and the exterior, right? So there's no post, as you said, Rachel, there's no post enlightenment demarcation of self and other, but rather there's an understanding that what is inside also reflects and has a continuity with what is outside. Um, and I think that that is a pretty fundamental continuity um, that for many of these late Ming writers or literati definitely resolves tensions that we moderns might see between say what we observe and what we feel. And Pauline Lee in her work on Li Zhi, which is brilliant, everybody should read it. Um, she talks at length about what the consequences are of this kind of continuity between not just interior and exterior, but also between the individual and what we would consider to be nature or the natural world. Um, and a lot of this, as you probably all know, is linked to um, uh, late, you know, Xin, late Ming Xin Shui understandings of the interior self as being um, related to and reflecting the wider patterns of the universe, which are also seen not just as empirically true, but also normatively correct. Um, so the question about who determines what is authentic and valid in poetry, um, I find to be quite, um, as a modern person, I find to be quite uh, an important question. However, I would imagine that these late Ming literati would not necessarily see that as a problem or even as a question because they would assume, um, and I think Li Zhi emblematizes this kind of assumption, is that um, we would all, if we were feeling the right thing, it would all be the same thing or a version of the same thing. Um, and Li Zhi at one point even goes so far as to say, well, um, even ritual would be uh, undergirded by this real Qing. Right. So, I mean, Leecher frequently criticized the ritual and social conventions of his time and place, but one gets the impression that he's sort of saying, well, if ritual were just the right kind of ritual, then everybody would agree with it. And it's not the case that he's some kind of radical relativist or pluralist who sees lots of different um, ways of life or experiments and living as legitimate and necessary. Rather, he's sort of saying, well, if, if we get the right, if we get the right thing right, we'll all be thinking the same thing, whether we're commoner or elite. Um, so instead, what I've been doing in more recent work is exploring the extent to which if we say, for example, that the interior and the exterior are uh, continuous, it's often the case, I think, in a lot of examination, scholarly literature on the Ming emphasizes the ways in which literary expression reflects this interior self um, and then it's sort of released into the world, right? And, and it's part of what helps cultivate the person morally so that they can participate in worldly affairs. But I'm wondering also if we could say that a documentation of a different kind of exterior might then have a reflexive effect on the interior um, ideas, subjective feelings, thoughts of a person. So that is to say, and I think I'm trying to get at this a little bit in the paper, when I talk about Jiang Ying observing, um, you know, uh, impoverished people, people in precarious situations, wondering if the documentation of their experience would then change what poetry means, right? It would sort of give us evidence uh, that our interior understandings have to then be changed in order to remain continuous with what is presented to us as a new aspect of reality, of empirical reality. So that's my very minimal response to your very interesting comments, but thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Professor Jinko. Uh, so let's welcome our second commenter, uh, uh, Dr. Zhu Ain Wu. Uh, she is a cultural and intellectual historian and, and also historian of science and late imperial China. Her research interest is in the episteme and world will that both shaped and were shaped by early modern Chinese perception and interpretation of their experience of the world. Uh, 
She is particularly interested in understanding the way of seeing, thinking, and explaining the world outside the moral self. As they were anchored in the cultural and intellectual historical debate about how to gain knowledge, um, Zhu Ain uh, o received her PhD in uh, History and East Asian Languages from Harvard University last year, and she is currently a postdoctoral associate in the History Department of the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. Uh, so let's welcome her. Um, hi, you can, you can hear me, right? Um, thank you so much for this uh, presentation. I, I uh, actually agree a, a lot with what Rachel had uh, commented on the significance of your work. And I'm actually uh, really grateful to, to hear that um, um, uh, you are, as a, as a social scientist, um, you, 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 you see the value um, in, in this various literary form as the significant source of enhancing our knowledge about how the social science science um, or uh, his, history of intellectual thought can be studied. Because um, I think uh, poetry and all, all sorts of other miscellaneous writings are very easily brushed off because people think, oh, it's all imaginary, literary, and uh, hence uh, does ha has no uh, bearings on our uh, research on you know, what is real and, 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 and what is a fact. And, um, whatever. So um, I'm very glad, and I would be very interested in reading your forthcoming book for that reason. Um, but I have uh, just two questions, and one is, I guess, uh, well, maybe both of them are kind of broad, and maybe you articulate them um, in your book chapters. But one is, um, the first question I had was, uh, you, you talk about, you know, this reality, and that's uh, what, what was your uh, uh, title? Yes, um, authenticity, accuracy, and and reality and validity. They, these are all very, you know, these are all very large concepts, right? And history of science, they basically write a book on each of those concepts. And and I I think what what seems to be at, at the core of your 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 uh, talk today is real and and reality. And I was wondering what kind of reality um, or realness. Um, that you are specifically focusing on. I see it, but then I think um, it seems to be a critical issue that kind of needs to be um, articulated more clearly. Perhaps um, I think such a process would even challenge our own um, fixed ideas on the definition of real or justifications we require when uh, someone makes a claim on what is real. Um, but the intriguing significance and the potential problem of reality based on this concept called Qing was Basically, that the reality validated by Qing comes from one's own mind, or depending on the philosophers, the human nature overflowing, uncontrolled, and raw and raw nature, which means that the focus is on not the objectivity that we usually attach to this concept of real, what reality and fact, but it focuses on the subjectivity and the individual who experiences and expresses. And if you think about it, the modern science. It's all about experiences, it's all about experiments, but then if it's just one person who claims it, there will be questions, right? So that 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 speaks to this changing and different um, criteria that we 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 pose uh, when we think about what's real and what's fact, uh, and how how to validate what is what is real and whatsoever. So I think that's a that would be a, a an important issue if, if you. Um, 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 maybe it's in your chapter, but if, if it's not, I think, um, you know, that would be a question that that would be interesting to ask. And kind of um, con uh, going beyond that, going beyond this literary scene that you're focusing on today's talk, um, do you do you talk about or do, do you think about how does this this idea of of, of realness based on Qing and subjectivity and individual expression? Um, and individual interpretation of one's feeling and experiences map onto the uh, political debate of the time. Um, because you're a political um, um, uh, scientist, I, I, I uh, want to kind of hear about how you, how, what, what kind of significance and relevance uh, that you found in these literary debates um, and their ideas on 
what's real and how um, and what the, the valid reality and accuracy of, of one's own experience. Um, um, it, when in your your thoughts about the political thoughts in in, in China, and kind of connecting uh, on that, this is a broader question. Um, given your expertise in political science. Uh, would you uh, be uh, willing to discuss how this cult of Qing or authentic self-expression in the era of so-called enlightenment of Chinese enlightenment? Um, I think there will be a, someone will argue against it, but then let's, let's say it is. Um, how does these concepts that you today that you talked about today map onto the trajectory, like broader and longer trajectory of the changes or history of the political thought in China? And you mentioned the scholars who, you know, argued uh, that the 17th century is a, a, a moment of, of Chinese enlightenment. And you know, you probably will know that also know that the problem that they and the field ended up um, 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 facing was precisely that, well, there was all these um, potential um, sources of modern development, democracy, science, and whatsoever in 16th, 17th, 18th century China, but there was no democracy or science and whatsoever. So, so that was that used to be the big question that the historians of um, intellectual history, political political thoughts, and history of science have encountered. And now I think they are moving toward um, um, exploring different questions. But the old question was still I want to wanted to ask, given that. Um, is, do you see, uh, I, I don't think answering that question is interesting anymore. What I'm asking is, um, how does this very interesting um, 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 development that you saw uh, by using these literary um, sources um, uh, um, um, highlight on the maybe a different um, trajectory, different ways of thinking about how the political thoughts um, develop over time in the very specific context, political, intellectual, and cultural context of of um of China, um, where does what we see in this late Ming moment lead to? Um, maybe it's not the question that you're interested, in, but then if you have any, if you have any thoughts, I think it'll be very interesting to 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 learn about. Um, uh, yeah, just those two questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Juhyun. Um, should I respond directly? Well, yeah. Uh, yes, please, Professor Chiku. Okay, thank you. Um, so these, you're right that these are really big questions. And as it happens, um, I just recently, within the last few weeks or so, started to think about authenticity from the perspective, from the sort of the Western perspective. So I've been reading a lot of work on what authenticity means, particularly in the folklore movement in Europe and the United States, starting like in the 18th century. Um, and all I can say is it's sort of cracked the whole concept open like a melon. And there is so much that's implicated just in this one concept. I mean, as Juhyun was saying, like I could, anyone could write a book just on authenticity, just on accuracy. These are such big concepts. Um, so I'm very aware, and I'm actually quite remain interested in, in the fact that, for example, something like this authenticity that people like Jiang and Ke are associated with real emotion, actually had very little to do with this genealogical concept of authority or authorship that etymologically is related to our existing concept of authenticity, which comes from the Greek, um, which in, entails a kind of like original authorship or something that originally like, you know, kind of comes out of an, an individual subjective experience. They were much more interested in the ways in which authenticity validates a kind of shared uh, reality. Um, and so I'm, I'm exploring some of the implications of that. And there are actually some, I believe, political implications, but one of the things one of the things I guess that's been disturbing me for some time as a political theorist is figuring out what political means. Um, and I happen to know there are some political theorists on the call. Um, I can see you, <laughs> and not to put you all on the spot, um, but I can see you all. So you can jump in whenever and let me know um, if you figured out what political means. But I think 
what's what's troublesome about that is um i think outside of the field of political theory and political science Many people seem to assume that political has something to do with the institutions of the state. Um, and I don't know that I've ever really been interested in the institutions of the state. What I have been interested in is knowledge. And knowledge has political dimensions insofar as it's bound up with power, institutions, status, um, and claims which are authoritative, right? So I'm, I'm interested in thinking about how claims come to be authoritative. So in that sense, I guess, um, that's the only way in which I'm political. So um, this relates, however, to Ju uh, to Zhuzhong's comments about um, these big questions, or what were once big questions in the history of science and intellectual history. You know, why was there no democracy in China? Uh, why did science not develop in China, right? Like Joseph Needham's question. Um, and my response to that is to say, well, the political aspects of this is not necessarily to interrogate what was happening institutionally or at state levels, but rather to think about how our own understandings of knowledge entail that we find certain kinds of genealogies or certain kinds of parallels between what is ultimately a Eurocentric discipline of science or intellectual history and um, that of China. And so I try to rewrite, I don't know, rewrite is very ambitious, but I, I try to look at especially early modern China, late imperial China, um, quote unquote, on its own terms, which entails um, sort of seeing it as internally self-sufficient, at least theoretically, and sort of understanding it not necessarily as reflecting something that had to happen because it happened in Europe already, right? So um, that's a very long and abstract answer to your question, Shuhan. But that's sort of where I'm going with this project and, and a lot of other projects I'm currently involved in is sort of thinking about what it means to sort of see something like authenticity um, as having its own career or its own history in China. Um, they contrast in interesting ways with that of its career in Europe and America, but is not reducible to it and does not necessarily need to be um, enthralled to it. Right? So I think that's all I'll say about this. But thank you for those for those comments. Uh, oh, thank like, you. Jujun, do you have a do you have a follow up? Sorry, it looks like she might want to. Follow yeah, up. yeah. I I just uh, well, need to add. I just um, while listening to your 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 talk, I was just constantly thinking about the question. One question I I I had to um I was asked multiple times, which was um why why these scholar officials so many of them write literature. <laughs> I never questioned that. I thought, well, if you're Chinese liter literati, then of course you write poems. There's no question. But then, um, you know, like this this talk talked about Qing, and then you know how um, actually these scholar officials, they were used to be obsessed with Li, right? And then sometimes Qi, Qing was um, um, thought in juxtaposition to Li, because Qing is something naturally comes out of your mind. And uh, you said, uh, you know, uh, Qing points to something real and self so ran right? But, you know, these are not their self so but it's a completely different kind of in a sense that it's, it doesn't come from you. Maybe, oh, you is in part of this giant universe, and maybe in that sense, it does come from you, but then actually, it's, it's this giant grid or certain pattern, you know, cosmic pattern, right? That you kind of have to uh, try to match and whatever. So the question that I got asked about why these people write poetry or like literature any, in any sense, while um, actually they, while, while they can just write political treatise or whatever, um, I was thinking that, um, you know, there's this D shit that was kind of losing appeal to these, a lot of these literati, scholar uh, officials, especially by the late Ming. And then, and then of course, there are a lot of, lot of uh, Li Xie uh, scholars, and then most of them are, all were trained uh, with Li Xie still. But then some of them uh, were going into a different direction and experimenting with, for, for instance, cult of Qing, and then these various literature you mentioned, vernacular literature, um, plays um, and other fictional writings um, and a lot of EG that does all sorts of things while serving as official or not. So I, I thought that would be um, 
I, I don't have an answer, but then that was an interesting question I had. And I, I thought, oh, you might, it might also, I don't know, be, be interesting to you going forward. Because like, wh why these um, politicians also write a bunch of poems and, and um, 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 sometimes fictions plays? So why are they so involved? It's a diff if it's a different way of, of, of expressing, I guess, self, but not only expressing self, but then also expressing and and, and, and recording reality in, in some sense. Because I think poetry for a long time was a vehicle of, of recording the occasion. It, it is about fact and realness in a sense that it kind of works as a journal diary. It is about recording uh, the personal history. But but it, should we take that as a given or is it something prompted by, I don't know, something something else, I don't know. Just, just, just throwing, it, throwing it out there. Because that, that, that now is a question for me. Maybe it's not a valid question, but then Maybe it's not say something, um, especially if we are interested in studying this this moment of this history in China. Yeah, but thank you so much for an, your answer. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I just want to say that's a great question, um, and that's exactly why I. This is why I, a political theorist, started studying poetry because it strikes me not that I mean I that we shouldn't instrumentalize literary work in the late Ming, by which I mean we shouldn't simply see it as an epiphenomenon of something else that's really going on. Rather, literature and poetry were the domain in which everything was happening for them. Like those were the most important uh, forms in which things like, in which everything was debated, in which what really counted was debated and talked about and expressed, right? So it was not necessarily like the, the many, many memorials they were writing or, you know, the memos or the, or, or the, the even like the legal judgments, but rather if we are interested in, I guess a contemporary political theorist would say something like their world-making capacities or their theories about the ways in which um, all of these topics that we as political theorists claim to be interested in, community, voice, um, uh, justice, um, you know, all of these things were actually playing out in questions of literature and poetry, which meant that the questions were actually somewhat different. And this is something I struggle with, not just with this project, but um, as uh, Louis Al mentioned, I recently completed writing a textbook on political theory, which tries to see political theory as a global enterprise or political thought as, as, as something that's happening across time and space. It's global in scope. But that also meant including lots of things that don't, certainly don't look like political treatises, that look nothing like the canonical texts of Western political thought. Um, and so I think it'll be an ongoing challenge, but I think it has to happen. I think we have to start breaking apart these expectations we have about what political is or where it's happening. Um, so that's my that's my reflection on your reflection. Um, but I think it's a conversation we have to continue because I think that's the only way that Chinese thought will be validated as, as, as something that's, dare I say, real political theory. Thank you, Professor Jinko, for your response. Uh, and also thanks uh, our commentators, uh, Joanne and Arichu. So we still have around 10 minutes for open um, discussions. If you have any question, uh, you could just raise up your hands or you could put it on the chat box. Uh, okay, Simon Loy. Hi, Simon. It's nice to see you. So nice to see you. Uh, um, yeah, so I just have a question about uh, uh, the, the either boundary or the different kinds of views of Qing uh, here. So as the vehicle of moral cultivation, Qing has the function of uh, enabling the individual to respond to worldly affairs in the proper way, right? And so we see a great deal of this on the chapter on music in Qingzi. Um, but Chinese intellectuals were also, um, or thinkers were also cautious of its excessive or overwhelming expression in a certain way. So we can see this in the debate about um, the relationship between sagehood and, and, and emotions, right? Whether uh, 圣人有情 or 无情. Uh, 
So is this also the case when it comes to connecting to authenticity, when it comes to interpreting uh, one's lived experience through um, our um, aesthetics? Or do you think Qing has different dimensions or the use of Qing has different dimensions when it comes to connecting to authenticity? Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. Um, I I guess my response would be to say, I, I suspect that the late Ming period is a very special kind of period where certain kinds of things became thinkable and possible, um, whereas they had not been thinkable or possible before. Um, so one of the things they were saying, I think was that things like Li, like ritual or sagehood had to be fundamentally recalibrated because they didn't, they had gotten too far away from what Chu Qing was, right? So they were all battling out this um, it, it, about they were they there was a lot at stake because it basically said, okay, how do we have real knowledge of what ritual should be? How do we have real knowledge of what a sage? Like how do we know a sage, right? When we see one, um, and their response to this was to say, well, we can access some of that knowledge through our Qing, and that will validate our experience as real, right? Um, and I think maybe in earlier dynasties, there was, I mean, certainly in earlier philosophies like Zhu Xi, right? He, he says the emotions should be calibrated and regulated, for example, through reading something like the Shi Jing, but he also seems to think that certain kinds of emotions are going to obscure our access to that truth, to that knowledge, right? And I feel that these guys, these late Ming thinkers, were very willing to say, no, these emotions, even erotic emotions, right? They were not obscuring our access to the truth. They were facilitating it. They were validating it. And I think they were kind of unusual in, in that sense. They were not Shunzians by any means. They were radical Menchians. Like if we had to use classical Chinese philosophy to understand like sort of where they stood, I think that they they embraced a very radical interpretation of Menchus and his and his views on Xing, not Xing, using Qing to confirm or validate Xing, like human nature. Thank you so much. Thank you, Simon. It's great to see you. <laughs> great to see you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Simon. Uh, we still have a question for from Dot. Uh, hey, um, thank you for, for having me. Lee, this was brilliant. Um, and the discussions questions were, I have learned so much from this talk. Thank you so much. As usual, from, from the talks you give, Lee, I have like three million interrelated questions, but I'll try to keep it really short. Um, I'm very sympathetic with your struggles against these sorts of disciplinary confinements of what, you know, politics means or, or could be. Um, but I want to, my question is really about the translation of the term ting as emotions. Um, let me come at this from sort of two, uh, uh, two perspectives, right? The first is um, obviously ching is to be understood in, in relation to a, a wider kind of Confucius philosophy or ideas of sagehood, as you mentioned, I'm a little curious about whether at all it would map onto other sorts of Chinese cosmovisions, for instance, the idea of understanding the the body in terms of meridians, you know, and, and this sort of very traditional what they call nowadays traditional Chinese medic medicine, right? So would Qing have any kind of relation to what's going on bodily in, in that sense? And what made me ask this question is because if you look at the term emotions in, say, in, in the Enlightenment, let me just make it simple and, and talk about Benedict Spinoza, right? If you look at the... the it, the emotions in Spinoza's philosophy, you have what is called affects, which he in turn gets, you know, from, from the Latin, which then comes from the Greek, etc. But but the affects can be both 
uh, sort of subjective experience as well as an experience of being moved by things outside of oneself. And these things can be sort of emotional, mental, and, and bodily all at the same time. And then you get this whole distinction between active affects and, and passive affects, which is sort of just one just undergoing things, which again comes from, you know, uh, Christian medieval scholastic philosophy. So <laughs> how would Qing map onto these things or not? Um, and and with and those, I I'm not expecting you to answer this fully because of of the difference in the difficulties in conceptual translation. But I think I should just stop there. Sorry. Thank you. Thanks, Dot. It's great to see you as well. Um, I didn't realize there'd be so many uh, friends on the call, which is really um, I really uh, gratifying, and it's great to see all of you. Um, I thought that you were going to ask me about natural and Zoran because we've had this debate um, before. But I'll tell you, I um, I'm really struggling with translation. And when the first version of this paper, so I should mention this paper is forthcoming in Orin's Extremis, um, but but I think I actually might still have some scope to make revisions based on um, all of all of your comments, which is good. Um, but it's it's forthcoming and. So I, I had two reviewers look at the paper and in the original draft of the paper, I didn't translate Qing at all because I just wanted to avoid <laughs> all of this, all of this nonsense, not nonsense. It's of course very, very important, but all of this, all these very complex and dense questions about what Qing meant. Did it mean emotions, sentiments, passions? And all of these words are used to translate the term in secondary literature on, on Qing. Um, and then the reviewer said, no, that's not acceptable. You must translate. <laughs> you can't leave it untranslated. It's like, <laughs> so um, at that time that I was revising, I was also deathly ill with COVID. So it could have affected my thinking, but I, I spent ages and ages looking at definitions, dictionary definitions, OED, examples from, you know, old English, middle English, um, for all of these words, sentiment, passion, emotions, what is it that Qing is actually talking about? Is there any analog in English um, that would sort of convey all of these uh, rich meanings? And and I, after like days and days of work, I basically just said, oh yeah, it's just emotions um, after all of that work. So I, I, I do think that it has something to do with embodied feeling. It's also metaphysical. I thought for a moment maybe sentiment would be one word I could use to translate it, but then it turns out that sentiment eventually in English becomes overlaid with um, ideas of rationality, um, because in English, uh, moral philosophy sentiment eventually, you know, sort of becomes captured as the right kind of emotion or feeling. And I think what some of these thinkers were trying to do was think about the ways in which Qing could disrupt what we take to be social convention or ritual patterning. Um, it still informed something real. They weren't saying that it wasn't real or natural, but but they were saying it would disrupt uh, business as usual. Certainly how we see our societies arranged today. It was meant to be disruptive. And, um, so sentiment didn't really, really capture it. Passions was too specific. It was too, had too romantic an ideal. Um, and it was pretty clear that they didn't mean passion in the sense of something that carries us away, right? That, that, that is unreflective or that's not subject to our control or our understanding. So I ended up just translating it as emotions. It's <laughs> We can continue having this conversation because um, as I mentioned in response to Chu Jean's comments, I'm continuing to work on ideas of authenticity in this period and later, including in the up to the 20th century. So um, Qing plays such a big role in these conversations uh, in Chinese discourse, so um, we can continue talking. Um, but thank you for your question, Dot. Uh, yeah. So, um, thank you, Professor Jinko, for your wonderful presentation, and uh, thank you for uh Rachel and uh Joan. Uh, thanks for your comments, and thank you all for joining our lectures. Uh, so, uh. Uh, today uh, we will finish it. Uh, so our lecture we will finish now, and uh, yeah. <laughs>
Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. This has been great. And sorry again that my camera is not working, but it was really fantastic. And I hope to follow up with each of you separately. Thank you so much for your comments. Yeah. Thank you so much to all the organizers. Thank you. As well. thank you. Thanks. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Bye. Wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye, everyone.